Amen. So keep your place there in Psalm chapter 139. So tonight we're finishing up a three-part sermon series. We're looking at the omni characteristics or the all-encompassing characteristics of God. So we looked in the first sermon, we looked at how God um, is all-knowing. You know, we think that we have a lot of knowledge today and we do a lot of things, create artificial intelligence and things like this, and we think that we, we just know everything. But not only do we not have all knowledge, but we certainly don't know um, out of that knowledge what's true and what's not, but God has all knowledge and knows the truth. So we looked at that in the first part of this sermon series. In the second sermon series, we looked at how God is... Um, what's the second one? <laughs> Come on, help me out. I'm blanking here. So God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God has all power, and he can do anything. So that's hard for people to kind of comprehend, and we focused on, you know, if God is all-powerful, then why does he let bad things happen? That's a lot of uh, unsaved people will ask that about um, God. And we looked at how, you know, God being all-powerful all with the fact, combined with the fact that he has given us free will, is why, you know, he allows, you know, things that go on today to go on, and that everything will be punished, justice will be perfect, and God does judge nations and people on this earth um, as well. But we looked at that in the second sermon. But tonight we're going to look at Psalm chapter 139. We're going to look down at verse number 7, and we're going to look at how God is omnipresent, meaning what does that mean? He is in all places, or He is everywhere. Look at Psalm chapter 139, and look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence. So the Bible here is saying is that God has the ability to be present everywhere. He can be present everywhere at the same time. Now that's a concept. It's really interesting in Psalm 139 if you look at the verse above that in verse number six. But God or somebody or some being being in the same, uh, being in many different places at the same time is very hard for us to understand understanding how God could be dealing with, you know, one person over here while he's also dealing with somebody on the other side of the world over here at the exact same time. That's hard for, you know, the human mind to kind of wrap their head around. But the, God, the Bible actually answers the question in one verse above where he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. It cannot attain to it. So God is higher than us. He is above us. We, you know, we don't have to understand everything about God. There's many things about God, like the Trinity and the mechanics of that, how those are just very hard concepts for us to comprehend. But all we have to do is just accept what the Bible says. We don't have to figure everything out because we can't figure everything out about God because he's higher, he's above what we're capable of. In Matthew 18, verse number 20, I'll just read it to you. The Bible says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So the Bible here is saying when two or three people, so look, God is in the midst of us now. So we're talking about how God is present. And if there's another, you know, church that preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ that's meeting at this exact same time, which I know there is, then God is there too. He is in the presence of them. He is in the presence of us. God has the ability to be everywhere anywhere he wants to be at the same time. All right, let's pray. All right, no, I'm just kidding. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. We're going to look at what that means for us. What's the practical application of that, right? You know, we'll get God's omnipresence, God's all presence, practical application tonight. All right, so the first thing I want to show you is that God is everywhere. He can be anywhere he wants to be at the same time. The first thing I want to go into tonight is what this doesn't mean. Okay, this doesn't mean just the fact that God is everywhere. If you just read verse 7 again, it says, Whither shall I free from thy presence? It's saying, and even in verse number, I think it was verse number uh, 12. Look down at verse number 12. The Bible says, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, talking about God, but the night shall shineth as day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Meaning, you're not getting away from God. You're not going to hide from God in the dark. You're not going to hide from God anywhere. God, the, the, the night and the day are all the same. So it's, he can be present in the night, present in the day, all of that. All right, but here's what it doesn't mean. Just because God is everywhere and can be in every place at one time, anywhere he wants to be, that, you know, that doesn't mean that God is everything. 
That you, you hear what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that you know God is you know is the world and God is nature and God is all these different things. Which is this is what people will push and will teach today is that oh God is God is in everything. You know you see a tree and that's God. No, that's not God. Okay, that is the creation of God. This is you know as a matter of fact this is kind of where. I don't really like the, the idea of intelligent design because intelligent can, design can kind of move in this weird type of new age direction. But this is one of the directions, uh, one, of the, um, one of the definitions of pantheism is basically this idea that you know, God is nature, that God is the universe, God is the sun, the moon, and the stars. That is God. Whenever you see that, look, it's this new age weird cultural new religion, but it's actually based in paganism of all kinds throughout ancient history. As a matter of fact, I remember um, just reading up on, we were really into um, like historical, you know, Western history, and especially where we grew up in North Dakota, we would go to a lot of, they had like Indian villages and, and you know, all kinds of places you could go and, and study the history of the Native American tribes and all these different things. And you know you could go and you could you see the history of kind of the the West and, and everything when it was settled, and look, ancient paganism was the religion of the the Native Americans. It was I remember the the Sioux tribe, which is kind of the the big tribe where I was from, where I was around. They literally worshipped like they believed that the earth itself had a spirit, you know, that the earth had a spirit and all the animals, you know, had a spirit and God, their God was in all of these different things. But look, this is even for the, the Native Americans, that, that paganism, that's nothing new. You know, this is people worship the sun. People have been, you know, the ancient Egyptians had a, a sun god and everybody's been worshiping the stars since, you know, the beginning of time. But turn to Romans chapter 1. But look, this kind of leads into this paganism. This paganism kind of leads into this secular philosophy of literally worshiping the earth today. I mean, that's, that's where this all comes from. This is where all that drives into. But this is not what the omnipresence of God means. This is not what it means. God is not nature. God is not in the trees. God is not in the animals. Look at Romans chapter 1 and look at verse number 20. It's, it's blurring a line that the Bible is very clear to draw. Look at verse 20 of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 talking about people that have walked away from God. They walked away from the knowledge of God. They want nothing to do with God. They hate God. And God actually gave them up. These are the, the wickedest people that you could see, that you could know. God actually gave these people up. And they're what the Bible calls reprobate. God gave them over to reprobate minds. But look at verse number 20. Describing this process of someone you know, getting into the point where God would reject them. The Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so, they are without, so that they are without excuse. So the creation and the animals and the trees and the sun and the moon and the stars and all these different things and everything that you see, you know, beautifully made, in the world today is evidence of the power of God. It is not God. It is evidence of God. That's what the Bible is teaching here. There, and it's, the Bible is saying that no one is without excuse. No one has an excuse because they can all see it. Yet instead, some people go and they worship it. They worship the creation. Look at verse number 21. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. They're, they're worshiping now the animals. They're worshiping now the nature, the animals, the four-footed beasts, the creeping things. And look at verse number 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves. Look at verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped. So this is not the truth, what I'm about to say. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So look, earth worship 
and the worship of the creation, I don't care if it's plants, animals, whatever it is, that is a reprobate feature right there. That is a wicked feature right there. Now look, I've explained this before, and this isn't the purpose of the sermon, but the creation is evidence of God's power. It's not to be worshipped. I don't think we should go out and just fill the, the air with dirt and throw trash everywhere. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we should not be worshipping the earth. We should not be worshipping the creation. It's the creation. We should be worshipping the creator, not the creation. And the creation is not the creator. That's the point of, of the introduction here. So that's what it, God being everywhere, that's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God is the, the creation itself. There's a very clear line drawn in Romans chapter 1. And it's not one that we want to go anywhere near. Because it's a, very, it's a line that is crossed by very wicked, reprobate people. All right, look at verse number, go to Proverbs chapter 15. So the question is, what does it mean? What does it mean for us that God is everywhere and can be everywhere? There's two applications that I want to give you tonight about this. The first one, look at Proverbs chapter 15 and look at verse number 3. So Psalm 139 said that you can't get away from the presence of the Lord. God's presence is everywhere. You can't hide from God in the dark. You can't hide from God in the daytime. The dark and the day is the same thing to him. God's present everywhere. But look at Proverbs chapter 15, and let's zero down on this a little bit more to see what this, how this applies to us. Verse number 3. The Bible says this in Proverbs 15, verse number 3. It says, the eyes of the Lord are in what? Look at that. It says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. That's a really powerful verse right there. If you just think about that for a second, I mean, that, that verse kind of encompasses what God's presence everywhere really means for us. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So God, what does this mean? God sees everything is what this means. Look at in Jeremiah 23. I'll just, uh, you turn to Luke chapter 12. I'll read for you Jeremiah 23, verse number 24. The Bible says in Jeremiah 23, 24, you're going to Luke 12. Can any hide himself in the secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Meaning, no one can hide from me. I what? God is saying, I see everything. So God's presence, the first thing I want to point out is that God's presence means to us that God sees everything that we do. Everything. Whether it be good or whether it be bad. Look, it's best to get in this mindset as a Christian. It is best to live your life in this mindset. You know, people, unfortunately, even Christians, they get in the mindset where they want to control what people see. They want to control what people see about themselves. They want to try to frame themselves in the best picture. They want to, you know, but here's the thing. God sees the real picture. God is the most important person that you need to see the real picture, and he sees everything. He sees who you really are. Look at Luke chapter 12. So it's best to operate your life knowing that God sees everything you do, because he does. <laughs> Look at Luke 12, 1. The Bible says this in Luke 12, 1. It says, in the meantime, when they're gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, it's so much that they trod one upon another, meaning there were so many people pressing upon each other. He began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in light, and whatsoever ye have spoken in the ear and spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. So Luke chapter 12 is pointing out the bad, the evil of Proverbs chapter 15. So it's saying that if you say and speak things, using the Pharisees here as an example, if you say and speak things in private, that these things are going to be known. These things are going to be known. I mean, if you are whispering and you are talking behind people's backs and all these different things, it's, it's going to be known. It's going to be brought forth. So don't do it. I mean, the Bible especially, I mean, 
in my opinion, maybe it's because I'm a man, but I mean, to me, I mean, the Bible in Matthew chapter 18 pretty much lays out, you know, if, you know, if I have a problem with somebody, it's like the worst thing I could do is go whisper behind their back to somebody else. That's the worst thing. I mean, the Bible basically in Matthew 18, just that Matthew 18 process that I preached about before, the Bible is basically saying, like, be a man about it. I mean, I mean, I'm the pastor of the church, and like, I want people to be respectful to me, and I don't want people to be, but I would much rather have somebody come up to me and just be like, Pastor, your preaching is no good. Like, I, no, that would be really rude, and that would just be like, you know, that wouldn't be, you know, great. But the point is, I would much rather have that happen than have somebody whispering behind my back. Think about it. Think about yourself in that position. The worst thing, especially for a man, I think. Well, no, it's bad for women, too. But, I mean, when I think about a man and what a man should be, like, go whisper behind somebody's back. But, look, the thing is, folks, this is a real cultural problem today. I mean, it is like a cultural sickness in our country today. And I'm not even talking about, yeah, it's a problem. It ends up coming into the church, but it's a problem outside the church. People think it's normal. People think it's normal to just go and, like, just trash people behind their back. You know, whether it just be, you know, somebody at work trying to get themselves ahead or trashing the boss or trashing a coworker or whatever, or, you know, forming alliances or whatever people do. People think it's normal on online, whatever it is. But the Bible says that, you know, this should not happen. But here's what you need to understand. God sees it. So why as a Christian, as a Christian, you should never do it? Because it's not going to go, it's not going to stay secret. Hello? You see people do it as Christians. You're just like, what are you thinking? Do you not know basic Bible doctrine? Like these things are going to be brought to light. And then how are you going to look? Then how are you going to feel? How are all the other people going to... Imagine if you found out that somebody had just been trashing you behind your back, who you thought was your friend, for like months. Imagine, what, I mean, imagine how hurtful that would be. You know, like it's a big thing. So look, it's a terrible thing. The Bible basically says, if you've got a problem with somebody, the first thing you should do, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, just let it go. Suffer yourself to be defrauded. That's the first thing. But if you just can't let it go, just go to their face and just be like, you know what, man, I just like, you offend me, everything you say. Whatever. Or you offended me this time, or whatever, and work it out. That way, just be a man about it and talk face to face. We don't do that anymore, though, because people are so, like, they're, they're behind a keyboard, they're behind a screen, and they're just so comfortable with this culture that has been pushed in the last 20 years. I don't think it used to be this way. I think, I think men used to talk face to face. I think men used to handle problems face to face, good or bad ways, but face to face. That's how it used to be. Now it's just this whispering little weasel culture that we have, and it's no good, and we should be nowhere near it. Amen. And number one, it's not biblical, but number two, God sees it anyway. So it, it's, it's, it's a double idiocy if a Christian does it. All right? It's going to be known, period. The sad fact is, you know, if people were thinking this way, just the idea that just, just that God, it's going to be known. God is going to shine the light on it. If people were thinking that way, like people would get into so much less trouble. Just think about that for a second. Here, here's something that, you know, I, I think about this a lot. And most of you have young kids, but you all need to be thinking about this when you have young kids. You need to be thinking about this. I am really glad that the internet wasn't around when I was a teenager. Say, ha, ha, ha. No, I'm serious. One thing that people need to realize, and you need to educate your children, and you need to repeat and repeat and repeat, is people need to realize, like, people need to treat email. They need to take, treat text messages. They need to treat social media like just everybody is looking at it. Amen. Every single text message you sent, look, I know I have done this to some of you. You pretend like you are sending it to everybody. So just don't ever send anything inappropriate. Amen. You ever text the wrong person? I do that all the time. It's embarrassing how many times I do it. I like text, but I don't text inappropriate things. So it's kind of like, oh, sorry, uh, Pastor Jimenez, that was for my wife. 
you know, but it was like, you know, could you pick up this or, you know, just talking normally, you know, where like people text, you know, if every, just pretend like everybody's looking at it all the time. And look, you need to teach your kids that because your kids, even though they're really small right now, they're going to be stupid teenagers one day. And they need to realize that every single thing that they text, they send, they put on social media, ugh, social media, just maybe not even have them on social media ever. Go ask my kids if they want to be on social media, they'll laugh in your face. I mean, it's like, is there anything good about social media? I, I don't know. Maybe there is. And, and I know that, you know, people can watch sermons, and I get that. And I don't really consider YouTube sermons that don't allow comments social media. But social media, I was, I was, uh, I saw a news article a week ago or two weeks ago where uh, the head of Meta or Facebook, whatever it used to be called, was in front of Congress. And I, I, this surprised me. I didn't know this was a big deal. But he was in front of Congress, and he was just getting beat down by all these congressmen, which is, you know, they're all just grandstanding and whatever. But I guess there was a bunch of parents in the, the, it was the, I think maybe it was the House of Representatives. I don't know who it was. But anyway, I think it was a bunch, of, there was a bunch of parents and, of families, a bunch of kids that had, they, their kids had committed suicide. I mean, these kids are getting on social media and they're being, you know, they're putting stuff on social media and then they're being embarrassed and all these different things on social media. And who knows what else is going on, but kids are killing themselves over this. Oh, it's a big deal. Like, you need to, like, prepare your young children for this new era that they're going to be walking into. And I've said this many times about the Internet, but you just need to make sure that you know what's going on on the Internet in your house. And it just, it, it's, it's, best to, it's best, though, it's best, though, that they just, they don't feel they have a need for it. You know, they, they have real friends, they're, you know, they're in church, and they just have a, a, a life where they don't feel like they need all that, but at least they need to be taught in this era. Because look, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't around when I was a stupid kid. Because I'm sure we would have done st stupid stuff. And it, then it would just be there forever. You know, and that's, that's not something that, you know, look, the, these parents that lost kids, like, those kids eventually found out that whatever they put on the internet, I don't know the situations, but it wasn't going to be deleted. <laughs> it, it was just going to be around forever. It's a really dangerous thing. It's a really dangerous thing. So for us as adults, just remember, everything you send into this space, just pretend like everybody's watching. Everybody that you know is watching, the government's watching. Be paranoid. Hey, here's where your conspiracy theories will help you out in your life, all right? Be paranoid and be like, the government's spying on me. I better be super appropriate right now. Just be that person. And it'll be good for you, all right? So look, because look, God is watching. God is watching, and for you, he promises you that things are going to be made known if you do things that you think are, you're keeping secret. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 6. So he says that I see everything evil and good, right? So he sees the good things too. So what's the application of that? Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse number 1. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So, if you just apply this idea that God sees everything that you do, and you're like, well, pastor, I'm doing good things. I'm going out, and I'm, I'm soul winning, and I'm, I'm doing good things at church, and all these different things. The, the, God's just saying here, like, you don't have to go boast about it. He's like, you don't have to go boast about the good things. Because why? Because God's saying, hey, I know the good things that you're doing. I see what you're doing, and you're going to be rewarded for every single thing that you do. So you don't have to go out and be like, hey, look at how great I am. Look at how spiritual I am. Look at how awesome I am. Because if you are doing good things, God sees it, and he's going to reward it. But then he says if you go out and you just brag about how awesome and spiritual you are, he's like, well, there's your reward. You're literally taking rewards away from yourself. All right? So look, the good things God sees too. And he'll take care of those good things. So just don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Just do good things. Do what you're supposed to do. And, you know, be quiet about it. But when I ask you about soul winning, this isn't what I'm talking about. Okay? I want to know how soul winning goes when you go out soul winning. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying that God sees the good things too. So the first point is this. God sees everything. Good and evil. All right? So just keep that in mind. As a Christian, we should know this. 
And we should operate this way. Turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 17, I'm sorry. Turn to Acts chapter 17. So the first thing, the first application of God being everywhere, having the ability to be everywhere, is that he sees everything. All right? The second one is this. The second application to us and why it matters for us that God can be everywhere at one time is that that means that God is available to us. Like for real, God is available to us. Look at Acts chapter 17. Look at verse number 27. The Bible says in Acts 17, 27, is that, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So the Bible here is saying is that God is not far from you. God has the ability to be with you and if you feel after him and you seek him. All right, look, God is available to you. This is a very real thing. A lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people, I think, dismiss this thought. You know, a lot of unsaved people will say, oh, you believe in some magic man in the sky. No, God is real, and he is available to anybody that is seeking him. First of all, for salvation, and that's a real thing. All you have to do is just go soul winning, and you will see this. You will see this. I mean, the, the proof that people that are seeking find the Lord will be proven to you in soul winning. It will be proven to you personally. I, just like all the time. I mean, just constantly. We had it proven to us yesterday. Just people that are seeking, just find. It's, it's God sets up. God uses us to set up these appointments. You've all had these situations where you come to somebody's door, you knock on their door, and you ask them if they want to hear the gospel, if they know if they're going to heaven. Like, we were just talking about this, and I was just thinking about this, and I was, just went through this thing, and I've really been bothered about this question. Yes, there's plenty of people that say I'm not interested, but the ones that are have been seeking for one reason or another, and that's why you're there. But look, even beyond salvation, God is available to us. All we have to do is seek Him, and He's not far away, the Bible is saying here. He's right here, and guess what? He'll work for you. He will work for you. Turn to Isaiah chapter 57. Turn to Isaiah chapter 57. He will work for you if you have the right heart towards him. Look at Isaiah chapter 57 and look at verse number 15. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse number 15. There's another kind of cool uh, proof of the Bible here in Isaiah 57, 15, the, the miracle of the Bible. The Bible says in Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. That inhabiteth eternity. So that's, that's interesting, right? So what are we talking about? We're talking about the omnipresence of God, how God can be everywhere at the same time. But let me, let's just add a dimension to that. God can be everywhere at the same time at any time. You're like, well, that's what the Bible just said right there. The Bible said he inhabits eternity. Eternity, meaning this sermon that I'm preaching right now applies to everyone that's ever lived. This sermon that is coming from the Bible, because God, has any, he inhabits all times. You don't inhabit all times. You inhabit like that. But God inhabits all times and any place in those times. And then the Bible says, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So the Bible here is saying, just as Acts chapter 17 was saying, those that seek him and have the right heart towards him, anyone that's ever lived at any time, God will be there for them. That's what the Bible is saying. For real. So now, how do we apply this to our lives? The fact that God sees everything and the fact that God is available to us. I really want to point out that there's two sides of this coin for you this evening. This can be good for you, what I just told you, or it can be bad for you, what I just told you. God sees everything. He's really there, and he really moves. It's bad if there's things that you don't want him to see. That's how it's bad. I mean, if there's all these secret sins that you have, there's all these secret plans that you have, there's literally places where your heart is not right and God knows about it. Maybe you're motivated by the wrong things. 
Maybe, you know, God even knows, since he inhabits all times, God even knows how those things that are in your heart right now will affect you down the road. And that's why it gives you that Holy Spirit to, you know, intercede for you. Because many times, and like if you pray a lot, and then you look back at your prayers and how they were answered, you will start to see how the Holy Spirit inter interceded for you. You'll start to see how the Holy Spirit, as I talked about this morning, literally changed the wording of your prayer. Literally said that, yeah, God, you know, he thinks that he needs this, but he really needs this. And you'll see that in the answers to those prayers. Maybe you think that you need money. Maybe you think that you need something in this material world, and God just really wants to show you that, no, 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 you just need to get your spiritual life right. And then he gives you the things that gets your spiritual life right, and then everything else just kind of falls into place as you get your spiritual life right, start reading the Bible, following the Bible, things like that. All right? So the point is this. It can be bad if there's things that you don't want God to see because God does see them. He does see them, and he's going to move against those things because he wants you to be as profitable as possible. He's got a soldier in this fight, uh, you know, and he wants to keep that soldier in this fight. So he doesn't really care about the things of this world. He cares about keeping you in this spiritual life. All right? But look, the good is this. The good is that you have access to a God that's present. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Not, look, you don't have, the good news is this, and I've always said this, and I feel very strongly about this, and it's absolutely biblical, but leadership you cannot lead from afar. Leadership, and this, I'm talking about any kind of leadership. I don't care if you're talking about military leadership. I don't care if you're talking about leading your family. I don't care if you're talking about leading a church. I don't care if you're talking about leading at people at work. Whatever it is, a leader must be present. You have to be there. Leadership from afar you know, this is, this is like, you know, in, in my career, it's like, it's like the engineer who's just never been out in the field. It's like the engineer who he just makes drawings. He's like, dee, 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 dee. he just makes drawings and, and does things in the office. And he just sends it out to the people in the field, but he never goes out to the field. He's not going to be a good engineer, or she, or whoever, is not going to be a good engineer, because you have to be there to see what's actually happening. Leadership is present. And this is the kind of leader that God shows us that he is as well. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and look at verse number 5. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be, with, be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. God didn't just come down and just put some power down here. He actually came down here and did it himself. He was God, but he came down and made himself a man. And being found as fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has, all, has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and look at verse number 15. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. You say, well, yeah, but God doesn't know what I'm going through right now. God doesn't know the things that I'm dealing with in my life right now. No, we don't have that kind of leader. We don't have the kind of leader. This is why Jesus came. We don't have the kind of leader that doesn't understand what we're going through. We don't have the kind of God that is leading us that doesn't understand. Look, first of all, he knows what you're going through better than you do. He knows exactly what's going on you because he's all-knowing. And he sees everything, even though I guarantee you don't see everything. He sees everything that you want him to see and everything that you don't want him to see. But look at Hebrews 4.15. It says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we say this all the time. We say that Jesus was with sin. That's how we could be that perfect sacrifice. And we use the example out soul winning like, well, this is my um, brother Jeff here, and, and brother Jeff, he might die for me. But Jeff, brother Jeff can't die for my sins because he has his own sins to pay for. The sacrifice wouldn't be acceptable. So yes, Jesus was definitely without sin, but he, was, he had the temptation of the flesh. It's not like 
put some magical power on where he just didn't feel any of the temptations that we feel. He just didn't give in to them like we do. So he was tempted. He went through all the pain, all the suffering, and more than we will ever go through. So we don't have the kind of leader that's just leading from afar and sending people into some battle that they themselves would never be willing to go, go through. That's not a good leader. You should never send somebody to do something that you, that you would not be willing to do yourself. And that is the kind of leader that God was to us. We just, I mean, we don't have that type of God that is just this lead from afar, push us into this fire, and not care what's going on. He went through it. He's there with us. And look, he went through life as a man and, and went through way worse things than we will ever go through. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse number 5. So look, we don't have that type of God. So what does that mean? We have access to a God that is present. A God that is actually there. You should use that. You should use that in your life. He's there. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He sees everything. Use it. Look at 1 Timothy 2.5. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You don't even need anybody to help you make the phone call. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. To, I mean, look, I'll, I'll give you advice and I'll help you out whenever I can. But look, you can just pray to God anytime you want. You can just pray to this present God that has all power and all knowledge that sees everything anytime you want. You don't need anybody else. He's there. And look, this God can and will and wants to make things happen for you. He doesn't miss anything. He's not unaware of what you're going through. He sees your problems before they, you see them. Think about that. You think about the problems that you have now. God saw those problems before you saw them. You say, so what, what, do, I, what do I do about this? Turn to Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to tell you tonight as you know, we, we wrap things up here, but I'm going to tell you how to utilize this. I'm going to tell you how to utilize this present God that knows everything, that has all power, to utilize this to the maximum capability in your life as a Christian. Why wouldn't you use this? Romans chapter 8, and look, at, uh, look at verse 28, which is a very popular verse that nobody understands. All right, it's a very popular verse. People have it on bumper stickers. People paraphrase it. People put it on their refrigerator, all these different things. Most people aren't even saved that have it on their refrigerator and have, you know, and that you have this saying. They have no idea what it means. Some people think it's Calvinist. I mean, it's just, it, people just make a mess of this great verse. The Bible says in Luke 6, 46, you're in Romans 8. It says, and why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now look at Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28, the Bible says this. It says, pay attention now. The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So everyone's like, see, you have to be called. Well, you have to, so many of the problems that people have with misinterpreting Bible verses is because they, they think about English as it is, as they learned it or as they didn't learn it, <laughs> one of those ways. The Bible here is saying, Somebody, I mean, the, I, the word called here, it means somebody who picked up the phone. Does that make sense? Like the phone rang and you picked it up, all right? If you're saved today, look, if you're saved, you picked up the phone. If you're saved, you know, somebody preached the gospel to you, ring, 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 and you answered the phone. You were called. God wants everybody to be called. God wants everybody to be saved, it called, the past tense. You took the call. This is what it means. Look, if you're saved today, God is calling you. God is calling you to do certain things with your life. They're all in the Bible. If you pick up the phone, you've done been called. You're called. It doesn't, don't, don't create some weird religion out of it. It just means that you're doing what God, you say, Pastor Brzezinski, I don't know. I mean, how could you even know? Because the Bible literally defines what called means here. Look at the verse again. 
It says, for them that love God, to them who are called. So to them that love, it doesn't say to them that love God and to them who are called. It says God to them who are called. Those are the two. Those equal each other. So people that love God are people that are called. It means the same thing. He's literally defining what this characteristic of this person is in two different ways, so it's no, there's no possible way you can misunderstand it. What does it mean to love God? Well, in John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. So you can be saved and not love God? Yes! Because love is action. It isn't some butterfly, weird feeling. Ooh, that's not love. That's what they tell you love is today. It's not lust. That's what they tell you love is today. Love is action. Love is, and it's the action of literally sacrifice. So love is actually doing what God wants you to do. So if you're saved, and then you're doing what the Bible says, you love God. If you're saved, and you forgot about the Bible, and you walked away from the Bible, you're still saved, you're just not loving God. You're just not somebody who is loving God. You're not, you're not taking action towards God and what he wants you to do, meaning you don't love him. Because if you love me, keep my commandments. God is saying, just what he, I just read for you in Luke 6, 46, he says, why call you me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? If you love me, keep my commandments. He's saying the same thing in a different way. He literally defines whether or not you love him. You're like, well, I feel like I love him. Well, see James 2. How did it do for your buddy who's freezing to death and starving to death? And you're like, love you, buddy. And you let him freeze to death. That's not love as the Bible defines it. If you love God, you are somebody that is following and keeping his commandments. And that is the same as being called according to his purpose. They mean the same thing. There's not an and there. For those that love God, those that are called according to his purpose, the same thing. So what does this mean? It says we know that all things work together for those type of people. So we have an all-powerful, we have an all-present, we have an all-knowing God that sees everything, that's here with us, that's near us, that wants us to call him, that wants us to pray to him, that wants to come in and help us, that can do anything. And all we have to do is do the things that he says. So the point I'm trying to get you to say through that long-winded explanation is give God every reason to help you. And he will. I mean, look, is it, we know that all things might work together for those that love God to them who are called according to his purpose? No, it says, we know that all things work together. Look, that's one of those promises. That's a huge promise. That is a huge promise. If you are saved and you are not doing what God wants you to do, you are leaving this one on the table in your life. Give God every reason to bless you in your life. Do what he says. Do what he wants you to do. I mean, it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. I mean, you think about it. He's there for you when you pray. He just wants you to be doing what he asks you to do, and then he'll make everything work out for you. You're like, well, I don't know what I need. Well, he's going to intercede for you. Look at, the, look at the verses before this. Look at the two verses before this and tell me this is an accident that these are in the Bible in this order. Look at verse number 26 of Romans 8.26. 8.28 is what we just read. We just read that major promise and now we know who the promise is for. It's for people who are saved and for actually being disciples. They're following the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. Now look at verse number 26. It says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. So you got problems, right? You're somebody that's got infirmities, you've got issues, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You're like, you know, this is a case for a lot of people. This has been my, a case for me in my life. You're just like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I know that there's problems here. I know that things aren't going well, but if I knew how to fix it, I'd fix it. You know, a lot of times you might not know how to get yourself out of the situation that you're in. It says, likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. So you just go and you just pray to God. You say, God, I got problems here. 
All you have to do is be like, God, I got problems here. God, I'm just going to do whatever. I'm just going to, I got problems here, but I'm going to continue to just follow you and do what you want me to do. Could you help me with these problems? That's it. And the Spirit will go to God and say, well, here's, here's the issue. He's got this problem, this problem, this problem, and then the Holy Spirit and God the Father, they'll work it out, and they'll figure out the mechanics of how to fix whatever's wrong with you. That's what the Bible's saying here. And he searches the hearts. He that searches the hearts knoweth what mind is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. Who are the saints? Right? Is that, you know, these famous people or whatever? No, that's you. That's anybody that's saved. So the Spirit makes intercession for you according to to the will of God. So all you have to do, no matter what is going on in your life, the Christian life is not easy, but it is super simple. All you have to do, whatever's going on in your life, is just do what you did yesterday. It's just do what God wants you to do. That's it. You're like, but you know what? It's really hard to you know, continue in the Christian life when I think that I need to go out and you know, do all this stuff to try to fix my own problems. No, you just can make sure you're doing what God wants you to do. Make sure that you are loving God actively and then just pray for help and God promises that he will work it out. That's it. It's simple. It's hard to do though because it takes faith. It takes faith because we're sitting here with these kind of people. If you're like me, you want to just fix everything yourself and you got this idea, I've always got a plan. You know, you always want to come up with a plan when all you really need to do is just love God. And just pray for help. And it, look, it might not be exactly what you thought you needed. But I guarantee it will be what you really needed. And he will move and you will see it. I'm here to report to you. He will move and you will see it. And you will look back and you will see what he did. And you will realize that he was right. It's a beautiful thing. So you say, well, you know, I'm not really seeing it. Well, I mean, what, what are you doing in your life that's preventing God from moving for you? That, that's what I would ask you tonight. Listen to the Spirit inside you. And guess what? I think you know. If, if there's something that is preventing God from blessing you or from answering a, a, a problem that you have or a question that you have or fixing something in your life, listen to the Spirit inside you. Those are the easy things to understand because that spirit, when you grieve it, you know. You know that you're grieving the spirit. And then just get it right. And then turn to Lamentations chapter 3. Turn to Lamentations chapter 3 and we'll, we'll end it here. Just get it right. Listen to the spirit. Get it right. Get back to doing what God wants you to do. And then look at Lamentations chapter 3 and verse number 25. The Bible says this, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. Are you seeing a pattern here? People that are seeking after God, that are following God, that are following his commandments, that are loving the Lord, the Lord is good to them. But just get everything that you can get right, right. Give God every reason to bless you, and then just wait for him, and he will take care of it. So look, to wrap things up tonight, to wrap things up tonight, just you got to understand this whole sermon series, is the, the point of the sermon series is this. God, God knows. God knows everything. He knows all truth. He is all truth. God has the power to do anything that we, we need done. And God sees everything that is going on. He sees things that we don't even see. I mean, so people would just be better off if they just always realized that God was always looking in their life. Because guess what? He is. He is. So get it. everything that you can right. Pray to God to help you. He sees everything, and he definitely has the power to fix it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.